Good afternoon. Welcome to the afternoon service or Lord's Table service of Grace Covenant Baptist Church. We're very pleased again to have Pastor Smith with us uh, today. His devotional this afternoon will be the Lord Forsaken from uh, taken from Mark 15. Uh, by way of other announcements, uh, I think you generally know what they are. I'll just mention that uh, next week we'll have J Dr. James Dozel with us for the day. Our pastor will be at Grace Community Baptist Church in North Providence, Rhode Island with uh, Rob Ventura and Jack Buckley. So uh, that's the plan for the week. We do have a rather busy month for the rest of April and then... Uh, uh, May, at least for our pastor, is, is quite busy also. So keep all of that in prayer if you will. Would like to ask you to uh, rise now for our call to worship, <clears throat> which is found at Leviticus 26. And I'm going to be reading verses um, <clears throat> 11 to 12. Leviticus 26, 11 to 12. Moreover, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul will not reject you. I will also walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. Let us pray. Our merciful Father and our God, what, what a wonderful God. What promises you have given to us that, that you will be amongst us. And even though we are few in number this afternoon, we know that you are here. We praise you for the things that we heard in this morning's service, that we must keep faith. We, we must not fear, no matter what is going on in the world about us, no matter what the weather is doing, no matter how the earth is quaking, no matter what befalls us, as we heard, Oftentimes it is you, Lord, taking some kind of effects, taking some kind of an impact upon us to get our attention, to turn us back to faith in you. So we praise you. We glorify you, knowing that you are a great and awesome God who has everything under control. We need to learn to get ourselves in that posture of trust and faith in you, and we would do that in this worship service as, as we hear our pastor come before us again. So get glory again to yourself this day, our Father and our God, Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, all these things we pray to your amazing glory and honor. Let your name be known about this globe this day. To the name of Christ we pray these, we pray these things. Amen. Please be seated. Our Old Testament scripture reading is found in the book of Leviticus. At chapter, we're at chapter 26 now, reading through the Old Testament. Today I'll be reading verses 1 through 26. And uh, these are words from the Lord to Moses. These are instructions to the Levites and the priests. The, the entirety of the book of Leviticus is instructions to Levites and priests. So we've earlier been through uh, the laws pertaining to sacrifice, ordination of Aaron and the beginnings of the priesthood, prescriptions for uncleanliness, guidelines for practical uh, holiness, and today, specifically, we're in uh, our exhortations to obey the law and the blessings and curses that will follow if you do so or do not. So uh, with that, let's read, the, I will uh, read the chapter 26, 1 through 26. You shall not make for yourselves idols, nor shall you set up for yourselves an image or a sacred pillar, nor shall you place a figured stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. 
I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments so as to carry them out, then I shall give you rains in their season so that the land will yield its produce and the trees of the field will bear their fruit. Indeed, your threshing will last for you until grape gathering and grape gathering will last until sowing time. You will thus eat your food to the full and live securely in your land. I shall also grant peace in the land so that you may lie down with no one making you tremble. I shall also eliminate harmful beasts from the land and no sword will pass through your land. But you will chase your enemies and they will fall before you by the sword. Five of you will chase a hundred and a hundred of you will chase 10,000 and your enemies will fall before you by the sword. So I will turn toward you and make you fruitful and multiply you and I will confirm my covenant with you. You will eat the old supply and clear out the old because of the new. Moreover, I will make my dwelling among you and my soul will not reject you. I will also walk among you and be your God and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt so that you would not be their slaves and I broke the bars of your yoke and made you walk erect. But if you do not obey me and do not carry out all these commandments, if instead you reject my statutes and if your soul abhors my ordinances so as not to carry out all my commandments, and you break my covenant, I, in turn, will do this to you. I will appoint over you a sudden terror, consumption, and fever that will waste away the eyes and cause the soul to pine away. Also, you will sow your seed uselessly, for your enemies will eat it up. I will set my face against you so that you will be struck down before your enemies and those who hate you will rule over you and you will flee when no one is pursuing you. If also after these things you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. I will also break down your pride of power. I will also make your sky like iron and your earth like bronze. Your strength will be spent uselessly for your land will not yield its produce and the trees of the land will not yield their fruit. If then you act with hostility against me and are unwilling to obey me, I will increase the plague on you seven times according to your sins. I will let loose among you the beasts of the field, which will bereave you of your children and destroy your cattle and reduce your number so that your roads lie deserted. And if by these things you are not turned to me, but act with hostility against me, then I will act with hostility against you. And I, even I, will strike you seven times for your sins. I will also bring upon you a sword which will execute vengeance for the covenant and when you gather together into your cities, I will send pestilence among you so that you shall be delivered into the enemy's hands. When I break your staff of bread, 10 women will bake your bread in one oven and they will bring back your bread in rationed amounts so that you will eat and not be satisfied. This is the word of the Lord, uh, a very scary word let us take it to heart, let us take it to bring us to full compliance with his laws and commands. At this time, if you would take out your uh, confessional heritage, uh, we're going to be, uh, we are in chapter one of uh, the second London Baptist Confession, the 1689 Confession, the Philadelphia uh, Confession, uh, whichever you would choose to call it. This is a confirmation of our faith, and today we are, uh, we are still in chapter one, 
and we'll be reading uh, paragraphs three and four of uh, ten in uh, ten paragraphs in chapter one. And so uh, we will read this in unison. And I am ready to begin. Paragraph three. The books commonly called Apocrypha, not being of design integration, are no part of the canon or rule of the scripture, and therefore are of no authority to the church of God, nor to be any otherwise approved or made use of other than human writings. Paragraph four, the authority of the Holy Scripture for which it ought to be believed dependeth not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author thereof. Therefore, it is to be received because it is the word of God. Amen. If you will take your hymnals and stand with me now to uh, hymn 262, God in the Gospel of His Son. Father, we we'll now read Luke 24 and verse 32, and then pray, and we'll have our devotional. Luke 24 and verse 32. This is, of course, after the Lord Jesus, after his resurrection, was speaking to uh, the disciples on the way to Emmaus, and in verse 32, and they said one to another, was not our heart burning within us while he spoke to us in the way, while he opened to us the scriptures? Well, let's pray that God would grant us that experience, though we're not there on some road in Jerusalem or outside of Jerusalem. Let's pray that God would give us that experience this day. 
Father, we thank you for your scriptures that reveal your truth to us, and we thank you, our God and our Father, for this historical example and illustration, and pray that you would even now come to us by your Holy Spirit with the Word of God, make the truth of your Word about the Lord Jesus Christ to be real to us, fresh to us, to change us, to transform us, that we would be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask for these mercies in his worthy name. Amen. <clears throat> well, we all ask questions in life. Uh, I'm sure you have experienced people asking you questions, and you ask questions. Sometimes those questions are very easy to answer, like how many states are there in the United States? Fifty. Uh, sometimes there are questions which cannot be answered quickly or easily. How many stars are there in the universe? But there are, of course, even more profound questions, difficult questions, which we can ask, but we do not always have a comprehensive answer, such as, why did the Lord Jesus Christ die on the cross? That's a profound question, a question that is, in one sense, easy to answer, and we can answer it from our Bibles, but in another sense, because it is so profound, we cannot really fully plumb the depths of the answer to that question, why did Jesus Christ die on the cross? I'd like you to turn now to Mark 15 and verse 33. I'll just read two verses, and then reading those two verses, we will then consider briefly its content. So Mark 15, verse 33. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So notice, first of all, from this passage and this question of the Lord Jesus Christ, this profound question, notice it was actually an earnest prayer by the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a very personal prayer. Notice how the Lord cried out. He cried out, my God, not just God, but my God, it was a cry with a question, it was a prayer with a question, it was very personal, my God. Though experiencing abandonment on the cross by God his Father, the Lord did not abandon his love for his God and Father. He called upon him as my God. But notice also, secondly, the Lord Jesus Christ's prayer was repeated. The Lord understood and experienced that he was forsaken by God. He felt his total helplessness hanging on the cross. He was experiencing agonizing pain physically but also suffering under a consciousness of the anger, the righteous wrath of God. And he repeats his address to God, calling out to him, not just once, my God, but my God, my God. And of course, he was quoting from the Psalms. We know that, but the point is, this was an earnest prayer of repetition, my God, my God. And it was all the more earnest because several hours earlier, Jesus had actually said to his disciples, you will be scattered each to his own home and you all will leave me alone 
Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. But now on the cross, the Father is not with him. The Father has abandoned him. As the sacrificial lamb for the sins of his people, the Lord Jesus Christ, God and Father, had forsaken him and was not answering his cries. He was truly alone. And therefore he earnestly repeated, My God, my God, from the depths of his soul. And notice thirdly, the Lord Jesus Christ prayer was spoken in faith. He didn't pray uh, as some would have you pray. Oh, pastor, pray for me. You pray to your God. So you see, it was a prayer that he prayed in faith. It was my God, my God. He continued to trust in his God and Father, prayed to his God and Father in faith, even as he experienced the righteous wrath of God upon him as though he had committed all of those sins personally that were put to his charge. So you know, I know you understand, the Lord Jesus Christ in his person, in his soul, never ever was defiled by any sin, not only in his own life, but even on the cross, your sins as a believer placed upon Jesus Christ, did not actually defile his soul, his being. He still was holy, holy, holy. But he had those sins put to his charge, his account, as though he had done them. So think of all of your sins. Think of all of your sins, the ones you are aware of in your life, in your heart, all of those sins were put upon Jesus Christ to his account as though he had actually done all those sins. And God righteously punished all, his, all of those sins, your sins as a believer. He punished all of your sins in Christ. He punished them proportionately. You know that this is true. Some sins are worse than other sins. And Jesus Christ received the righteous punishment for the sins, all of the sins, of all of the elect through all of the ages. Now that is a massive amount of sins, even if you only consider your sins. You should contemplate at times the reality of your sins, not to become depressed, to be sobered, but to also then be grateful for what Jesus Christ has done in his death on the cross. And when you start to seriously think about your sins, the sins of your heart, the sins of your thoughts, the sins of your attitudes, the sins of your words, the sins of the tones of your words, the sins of your actions, the sins of your reactions, the sins that you've committed, the sins that you have committed by not doing something you should have done, like loving God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all the time. All of those sins were laid upon Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ was experiencing being forsaken and abandoned by his God and Father, and yet he still prayed to his God and Father, knowing that indeed, in one sense, he still heard him, though he was abandoned. It's a mystery. God is omniscient. He knows all things. Did he not hear Jesus Christ, his son's cry from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God knows all things. Of course he heard it. And yet there's a sense in which Jesus Christ knew that God, his Father, was not hearing as we read in Leviticus, the heavens shall become iron and brass. That's what happened to Jesus Christ on the cross. There was literal blackness for a season, picturing the reality that there was no communion between God the Son and God the Father. But the Lord Jesus Christ prayed 
repeatedly, my God, my God, in faith, my God, my God. And of course, the searching question, why have you, my God and Father, abandoned me? You see, that question reveals that Jesus knew and understood and experienced that he was truly abandoned. The abandonment of the Lord Jesus Christ by God his Father meant that he had no loving presence of God the Father. He had no communion with God the Father, and he was experiencing the righteous wrath of God the Father due to the sins of his people. And his question, why have you abandoned me? Why? And the Lord could have thought, I don't know that he did, why have you abandoned me? I, Jesus Christ, have never done anything wrong. I, Jesus Christ, have never done anything sinful. I, Jesus Christ, have never done anything unrighteous at any time, not in my heart, not in my affections, not with my words, my deeds. I always did the things that were pleasing to you. John 8. My enemies, Jesus might have been thinking, not in a sinful way, hanging on the cross. My enemies never once convicted me of sin. I came down from heaven not to do my will, but to do your will, my God and Father who sent me into this world. And therefore, Jesus cries out, you see, why have you abandoned me? That's his searching question. Well, what is the answer to that question? First of all, he was abandoned to satisfy God's justice. The soul that sins, it shall die. The wages of sin is death. The scriptures teach us that the Lord Jesus, who knew no sin, God made to be sin on our behalf. So again, all of the sins of all of his elect throughout all of the ages were laid upon Jesus Christ and now he took their place, and now as their substitute, he had indeed justice meted out to him as though he was guilty of all those sins personally. All sin must be punished righteously, and it is either punished in the sinner, in himself, in hell for eternity, or it is punished in the sinner's substitute, the Lord Jesus Christ, in his death on the cross as the Lamb of God. So the answer to that question, why have you forsaken me? First of all, to satisfy God's justice. God would not be righteous and just if he turned away from Jesus and said, okay, well, somehow we'll just kind of whitewash this or We'll forget about it. No, that's not the case. But secondly, he was forsaken by God in order to magnify God's holy law. Most people in our day think that if there is a God, he doesn't care about how I live. I'm just doing what I'm doing to please myself. He doesn't really care. I'm doing these things with somebody else in my own home, I'm not hurting anybody else, it doesn't really matter, you know, God doesn't really care. No, being forsaken on the cross reveals that God does care about his law. Men may think that God does not care. Men may think that God does not see when they spurn his law, but the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and God forsaking his only beloved son loudly proclaims to all men everywhere that God will uphold and magnify his law. But thirdly, why was he forsaken? To demonstrate to all the world, to demonstrate to each believing Christian the reality of God Almighty's love for sinners. Herein is love, not that we love God, 
but that he loved us and did what? Sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Hanging on the cross, Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God, the sacrificial Lamb of God. He was a propitiatory sacrifice, which as you probably all know very well, with Pastor Dunn as your pastor, a propitiatory sacrifice means that he turned away the righteous wrath of God by receiving into himself the righteous punishment due to sin. So here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us, sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God determined from before the foundation of the world to take the initiative to set his love upon specific law-breaking, guilty, wrath-deserving, God-hating, helpless, loveless sinners. And then loving those sinners, God purposed to make his son the propitiatory sacrifice for their sins so that they could be reconciled to God through the death of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So he was forsaken by God the Father on the cross out of love for his elect. Now I would also say we need to not... uh, Ignore John 3.16. Some Calvinistic people, they are almost embarrassed by John 3.16. They shouldn't be. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And of course, we do not know who the elect are. So we are to proclaim the gospel to everyone without distinction, without reservation, without embarrassment, without apology. We are to say to sinners, if you turn from your sins and trust Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins, you shall be saved. Isn't that what Paul and Silas said to the Philippian jailer? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Wait a second, I'm not sure if you're elect or not. No. So you see, God demonstrates his love that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for sinners on the cross. He was forsaken to manifest the fact that God has a sincere love for a world of sinners. And yes, I understand those that he truly loves in the saving way are his elect, but still... We shouldn't ignore the reality that God does have a general love for a world of sinners, sinners of all sort, all color, all nationalities. So God the Father and God the Son accomplish this amazing work of salvation out of a heart of sincere, infinite, unchangeable love for these sinners who believe in Jesus Christ. If you are a believer, God's love for you is seen in the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And if you are a believer, I want you to think, God's love is unchangeable. God himself is unchangeable. And God's attribute of his immutability, that he doesn't change, is true. And his love is immutable, unchangeable. Now, when I say that, I'm very conscious of the fact God is just more than an unchangeable God. We should never compartmentalize God. Well, he's unchangeable, he's good, he's merciful, he's loving, these compartments. No, God is one being. He's not to be divided up. But we speak this way to help ourselves at times to embrace this fact. When Jesus Christ set his heart of love upon you, when he called you out of your sins in darkness, called you to repent, called you to believe in him, he did that because of love from before the foundation of the world, and that love is unchangeable. 
And that's why he went to the cross. He died on the cross to save sinners, his elect, from all of their sins. He died as a manifestation of his love for you, a believer in Jesus Christ. He was punished by God so that you can be righteously forgiven for all your sins. He was abandoned by God his Father so that you will never be abandoned. Those who are cast into hell, who do not trust in Christ in this life, they are abandoned by God. The Bible teaches us truthfully, it's a hard thing to grasp, that they are punished righteously in the presence of the Lamb in Revelation. And yet, on the other hand, the Bible teaches us there is blackness and darkness forever. There is abandonment by God. But if you are trusting in Jesus Christ, he was abandoned in his death on the cross as the sacrificial lamb so that you will never be abandoned by God in this life and at death and in the world to come eternity. You will never be abandoned. Never. God is faithful and true, unchangeable in his love for sinners. So when we take the bread and the cup, we need to remember these truths about Jesus Christ and his death on the cross being forsaken by God so that you, the believer, will not be forsaken. You will never be abandoned because of his great love with which he has loved you. So we need to think on those realities till they affect our affections. May God help us as we partake of the bread and cup. So, uh, now I will read from John 13, I believe. <clears throat> 